And hello everyone. This is John Hopsis from Treasure House Books and Gifts again. And today we're talking with author Ron Perea. Hey Ron, how's it going? Johnny H, how do you do buddy? Doing well, man. Uh, Ron is the author, uh, certainly most recently, uh, several books, but his most recent book is Elsie and Elsa. And it has a lot to do with New Mexico history, something that Ron holds near and dear to his heart. So tell us uh, real briefly, uh, about uh, Elsie what and Elsa. Elsie and Elsa is about. It are a couple of Albuquerque High School girls who graduated Albuquerque High in 1943. They go off to L.A. They're sweet, demure, never had a bad word among them. Then go off to work as Rosie the Riveters. They come home after the war, cussing and a smoking and a drinking. And then all of the history of international caliber hits them, that around them, surrounds them, breathes in, and they're not aware of it. And that's how I write in all of the international historical events from the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. And it's an enjoyable read, if I may say so myself. And these are things that happened in Albuquerque, New Mexico. In New Mexico. Uh, a legitimate historical event from uh, California to Italia. Okay. Florence, Italia. But in the center, we are, and that's where the concentration is. Uh, Bataan Death March, uh, the Hamburger Hill in Vietnam. Uh, of course, our buddies down at the UFO, and we have to talk about him. Uh, sure, sure. And uh, and all the real, oh, you know the event happened in 57, where the U.S. Air Force accidentally dropped a thermonuclear warhead two miles south of Albuquerque. That's... How about the minute by minute account of how that went down? Where cool. most of you, if you haven't heard of that um, TWA that slammed into the into the Sandia Mountains in uh, '55, by coincidence though, I also include what happened there, same spot in 1960 when Kirk Douglas filmed his excellent hit, and I got to tell you, it was his favorite all right. his life. He said, "Lonely are the brave." Right. Right. And then five years later, they would build a tram over it. Right. And if you go there today, what still sticks out of the mountain? The tail end of that plane. There's, there's still it's some of the wreckage up there, yeah. yeah. That, uh, or how about when JFK partied in Albuquerque with a couple of his Hollywood friends? Or how about the, the end of the 60s when a, a international rock and roll sex guy came out of this town? <laughs> <laughs> and who might that be? Read the book to find out. No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> uh, you, uh, the, 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 it's, you can probably figure it out by showing the cover. <laughs> Gee, I wonder who that might who be. Is that? Yeah, there you go. There you go. I, see, Very that's cool. my cousin right there. Yeah, yep. Yeah. The strong family resemblance, right? You could tell. I'm not <laughs> a bit chilly going into that guy. Yeah. Now, one of the one of the things that I'll I'll go back because you kind of. Uh, uh, flashed over it real quick, but uh, you do talk about the Bataan Death March and you do have a personal connection to the Bataan Death March. Uh, I, my father, yeah. was a survivor of that week-long trek. Right. And I, it was hard for them. And I only found out about it about three years before Pop died at 83. Wow, he didn't because tell all anyone. All my life, like every kid uh, asks his dad, Dan, what did you do during the war? He said, shut up, kid. I'll tell you when I when you grow up. Well, three years before he died, he was 83, and uh -huh. we finally sat down, and I could not. I was uh, a grown man, and I was crying in my beer. I tell wow. you, I couldn't handle it. And finally, and uh, I was able to put down his, his final thought. And one thing that comes to mind, how somebody wrote a poem about this uh, mile-long trek of uh, 70,000 American troops marching five ahead for a mile stretch of men, 70,000. Somebody wrote a poem that read, no mama, no papa, no Uncle Sam. That's right. And that's because they thought they were abandoned. And nobody give a damn. That was the, the nobody point. Gave a damn. <laughs> that's right, that's right. And, yeah, and yeah. it's only because the yeah. constant supplies that they were normally right. getting Right. Was, where was it located? The supplies they were getting at the bottom of Pearl Harbor. And so there was no way they could be served. So that's how that happened. 
So let's let's ask let's ask another question. You had written two other books before, one based on your comedy club experience, which, uh, by the way, tell us real briefly about how you're related to that. Oh, Most people that don't book, know that. Uh, I'm the one who started the comedy club business in this town. Right. 33 years ago. And you know that's a fact because you were there. I was there. I was <laughs> and, <laughs> one uh, of your shows. That, and I always started my shows and in introducing them on stage. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to a night filled with smiles, giggles, and laughs. Right. So that's what I named the book. That's the first book. That yeah. was 16 years ago yeah. when it was uh, released. Right. Since then, the book itself was about all the adventures of taking the show up and down Route 66. So you know what? My publisher wants to republish the second edition. Right. And you know what the new name is going to be? How I Got My Kicks on Route 66. Perfect. I Perfect. think that's apropos. <laughs> yep, yep. And th then you went on and did a book about tango, uh, uh, the email tango. Well, uh, I'm a guy who loves the tango. Yeah, yeah. And I'm a guy who loves the women. <laughs> and so, and I pursue the women around the world on four continents. Well, I don't, but the lead character does. So, it, so this is, let's just say this is semi-autobiographical as well. Well, as you're the, trying to get to the point, aren't you? <laughs> So that's what the tell, but hey, and it all has a happy ending. Right, right. Well, having go, I wanted to go back to your other books and then ask, well, all of a sudden we have this book that's just steeped in history. What happened? How did you decide to do a book that was all about Albuquerque history? Well, uh, because I'm a history nut. And I was, uh, listen, man, I'm going to tell you exactly. My pop went through what I just told you he went right. through. That story had to be told. And then, uh, how long have we been living in this town with uh, international rock and roll sex, John? <laughs> how many people knew about the plane that slammed into the Sandia Mountains? How many people knew about the nuclear bomb? Right. How many people knew that this town was a home base where the initial Mercury 7 astronauts had their in, uh, loveless medicals? Medical and exams, many, yeah. And, uh, and then the, the 50s and 60s, how about the, oh, well, all of these things link together. And right. it just so happens that my grandma was a chef at the old Alvarado Hotel in 1922 as a Harvey girl. Uh -huh. Got older. Got older, so her prettiness doesn't help sell uh, waitressing, so she converted as a chef. And so that, she was so good at it, so she hired her. And they built this new hotel at uh, downtown se uh, on Second Street called uh, Hilton Hotel. Right. And uh, worked elbow to elbow with uh, Conrad himself. So she told. I remember her telling me about how she would serve uh, Conrad's fiance, Zsa Zsa. Oh boy. <laughs> I had to write about that. And then and how when she was at the Alvarado, she had to. Uh, she was hired to do a catering job for the hotel at the old Timo Theater, for the old Albuquerque Little Theater, uh, performing a show at the Timo Theater. Uh -huh. And who was the star of the show? Who? Uh, a, a, an actress by the name of uh, Vivian Jones. She left Albuquerque to go to Broadway. She changed her name to Vivian Vance. Vance, sure, sure. And so I had to write that in, first-hand experience. And uh, all these things personally happened to my family. Fantastic. So who had to write it in? Oh, and I haven't told you about the time that Dad was back from the war recovering. He went in at 168 buff pounds, came home 88 pounds. Wow, wow. And my, mom, uh, my grandma, uh, my dad's side, was afraid to send him out to work. And so he said, just go over there, son, and take care of the fence. Your brothers can take care of the cattle and all that. Okay. So he's out one day on Jul July 7th, 1947. He's repairing the fence. The barbed wire here, barbed wire there. And all of a sudden, at the horizon, he knew it was noon hour because the sun was directly overhead. Uh -huh. But over in the horizon, another bright light, right, as, high, as bright as the sun, in his face. So he decided to uh, um, travel in his Jeep across the 40 acres to get there along the way. Along the way, he could smell uh, carcasses. He knew what dead carcasses smelled like. Oh, God. And so he looked, and what he could see was 
two rows of five dead cattle. Oh my God. Their intestines surgically removed. Oh boy. No blood, no track marks. How the hell did they get there? And then all of a sudden he got sidetracked with that bright light over there. So he decided to go check out that bright light. And when he got there, it was on the road between his part, his uh, property and the neighbor's property. In between was a convoy, military convoy, troop truck, flatbed, troop truck, flatbed. Oh, my gosh. And one of the tarps had been blown off of one of the flatbeds. And so he could see bright, shimmering, high reflective metal. Today, we would call it aluminum. But back then, our aluminum was dull gray. Right, right. And so uh, that was high, sh highly sheen. What the hell? All of a sudden, troops start pouring, pouring out of one of the troop trucks with fixed bayonets. They ordered them, get it out of here, move it, move it. Hey, this is my land. You don't tell me to move off my land. And so all of a sudden, these troops get snaggled in his fence. And, and then all of a sudden, hey, I got a date tonight. <laughs> fixed bayonets, lovely lady. Lovely lady, fixed bayonets. Well, I'm here. <laughs> night, after my mom. And so, uh, so you could tell who went, but as he went, <laughs> as he took off and the row went that way, all of a That's sudden, a, a B-29 bomber flies over. He thinks to myself, to himself, where in the hell did that come from? The only place a bomber could come from was the field down in Roswell. Roswell. Mmm. Makes you and think. So, <laughs> and that was July 7th. 1947. Wow. And why is that uh, date embedded? Because four hours later, back in Albuquerque, there was a new dedication. There was a, the most famous international Albuquerquean had passed on, caught, a, caught one there in Okinawa. And so uh, eight months later, his widow always had emotional issues stuck her head in their oven. Oh, my gosh. And the city decided to buy that home. A year later, Clyde Tingley, the mayor, decided to dedicate the home as Albuquerque's very first branch library. Library. And so there was, they cut the yellow ribbon, and what was on the newspaper that next morning? Across the country and around the world. UFO found in Roswell, Roswell, Roswell. <laughs> you know, and uh, I, I was, I'm kind of personally involved in that. Yeah. So you ask me where I got all these stories? Straight from the horse's mouth. Straight. That's awesome. Well, very. Uh, we're getting short on time, so let's talk about. I know you have a ton of ideas uh, in the pike. So in the pipe, I guess. Well, my next say. novel is supposed to be a baseball book. Okay. It is a baseball book, but look what happened to the season. So oh. that's going to come out next year. There'll so still be baseball at some point. <laughs> we may not have it this year, but there's still going to be baseball. It's not like gone. Yeah, so. but not about the star home run hitter, not about the star pitcher, but right. when's the last time you heard a story about the star umpire? <laughs> and a family lineage of star umpires. Cool. And then my next novel after that is about the Alvarado and the Harvey Club. Fantastic. And then uh, you haven't heard about this, Johnny H. I next heard. one after that. We've all, anybody who's lived here sometime has heard of New Mexico's number one photographer, Tim Jew. Oh, of course. Sure. And so him and I are joining forces, and we're going to publish our own uh, photo coffee table book. Fantastic. And Fantastic. I narrate his photos. Oh, so you're going to give the historical background of the photos. Bingo. And, the, and the ladies and gentlemen, person. if you want to Pick up this, uh, it sounds promising. You know where to pick it up. At Johnny's Place on Trisha <laughs> House Books in Old Town. Right That's right. That's right. And uh, I guess uh, I, I guess we can uh, uh, put a little plug in that we are going to be open starting tomorrow, Saturdays and Sundays, uh, so June 6th and hey, 7th, uh, from 1 to 5 every Saturday and Sunday. You can still... Uh, come by, or you can still call us and do a, a, a browsing appointment, a 30-minute browsing appointment. We're doing those Monday through Friday, 1 to 3. Give me 24 hours uh, 
24 hours advance notice on that. 242-7204 is the number to call, as they say. And, and if you want to I, my book from you, Johnny, Yes. Uh, may, we'll make arrangements, and I'll come in and autograph it. That would be awesome. We can we can do a personal aut autograph signing signed book to you from Ron. You heard it right there. I would there. love to do and that. Real quick before we go, Ron, tell uh, you you have become quite the guy when it comes to uh, uh, volunteering museums and things like that. Where can uh, people thank you very much. when when people can get out and go to museums now? Where can we come visit you? I would like to invite everybody to the Wheels Museum where you can see an uh, adventure of how travel came into the Southwest, dating back all the way to the conquistadors to the now, with the heart being about how the railroad right. contributed yeah. primarily. Yeah, you want to hear a fact now that we're just in this COVID stuff? Sure. That during the 1919 pandemic of the Spanish flu, uh -huh. where was the epidemic, where was the epicenter of this? Right there at the rail yard. Is that right? The rail yard. Because yeah. that's where the virus Thanks. came in. Coming and what going. was the number one subdivision of Albuquerque? Brand new at that time. Morales. They were the, and so that's where the convolute and that were, they were the number one employer. Wow. So that's where the bulk of the people were. And, uh, and that was the main emphasis. And uh, just a little trivia fact. Fantastic. Well, well, Ron, I do appreciate it, and uh, it's always good to see you. you. You look well. You've got the whole city behind you there. It looks amazing. Uh, uh, I only have one more thing to say, Johnny. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome very much. And I think pretty quick here, Ron Perea has left the building, so to speak. <laughs> hey, so, did you know that that saying started in Albuquerque? No, I did not know. When he performed at Tingley Coliseum, on April 22nd, 1972. Wow. And I tell that story in my book. So Fantastic. Well, Ron, thank you very much. It's been fun. And again, if you want Ron's book, just give us a call and we'll get I you set up. I would love to it. autograph it for you. You got it. All right, Ron. Well, take care. Appreciate it. Take care, John. See you later.